I greet you tonight in the name of Jesus. Of course, he come to make all things new. Amen. Claire and I want to thank anyone and everyone that put this uh, festival together. We're deeply moved by it. Every year it seems to get better. I have a cousin that writes songs and he's very prolific. I said, Brian, what's the favorite song that you've written? He says, that's easy, the last one. <laughs> that's the renewals, everyone. The last one was the best. As soon as this one over, it'll be the best. Because it's always fresh. I'm standing where a lot of beautiful feet have stood this week. Mm -hmm. Because there's been a lot of gospel come from right here. It's beautiful feet. Now if we can establish it's holy, I may have to pull off my sandals here. <laughs> you know, Moses, he, uh, God, God run him down. God will do that. He'll find you. Even on the backside of the desert. In that burning bush, Moses had to check it out. Oh, whoa, pull off your shoes. You're on holy ground. Moreover, oh, you mean there's more? Yeah. I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And I'm here to send you to work. Well, Moses uh, had a few objections, but they got it worked out. But he did have this question. Who am I going to tell them sent me? Oh, the great I am. I am that I am sent you. Moreover, tell them the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob sent you. Brother Pat last year mentioned his ministry was a therefore. <laughs> Moses was a moreover. <laughs> well, it's, you know, the great I am is a wonderful thought. And God in a burning bush is a wonderful thought. But moreover, it was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That was the emphasis here. I want to talk to you about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He says, uh, by the way, that's my name forever. Yeah. Amen. And a memorial to my name. So when you think of God and you want to put a name on him, do you think of God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? What do you think about? When you think about God, it would be wise for you to think about God as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, the, my question to you, what justifies God making that name to endure forever? And he will be justified in his sayings. And he said, my name is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob forever. I want to affirm tonight in becoming the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that God used the principles of the gospel and the new covenant to become their God. Amen. Now, there's just a lot of little incidental scriptures that I could mention. I just mentioned one or two. They're in 1 Thessalonians very common verse. You got to turn to the living God from idols and wait for his son from on high. Now that's kind of a statement that fits nearly everybody. As a matter of fact, nearly since you got cast out of the Garden of Eden in Adam, people need to be doing that. That's about all they could do is turn from idols because the world become idolatrous and quick, even after Noah come become idolatrous again, turn from those idols, turn to the living God, and wait for his son from on high. Amen. 
Now, now, now just suppose, could you walk up, could God walk up to Abraham and say that with a straight face? I guess so. Now just think about it. Abraham, you need to leave these idols. Yeah, he, he lived in an idolatrous world with an idolatrous family. He needed to turn to the living God and wait for his son. And Abraham had trouble waiting for his son. <laughs> but he needed to wait for his son from on high. That was Isaac, of course. Well, we got another example here in Galatians 6, 14, where Paul's extolling the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ that gives us our peace and we glory in it. And he refers to us as the Israel of God. Well, now, who's Israel? He's nothing more than a sanctified Jacob. That's who Israel is, a sanctified Jacob. And so sanctified that God uses him as a metaphor for us all, the Israel of God. What history do you need to pass through to be the Israel of God? I am affirming that it is not only the history of Jacob, but the history of Abraham and Isaac. They had the unique privilege of leading us to God. It wasn't Abel. He's a good man. It wasn't Noah, a good man, righteous. It wasn't Enoch who walked with God. It wasn't Job. It was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, I'd like to just give you a little summation here of where I want to go in case I don't have time to get there. You'll at least have the summary. Abraham lived in an idolatrous world, but God chose him. Joshua 24, 2 and 3 shows where he's coming from. So here, God's sovereignty is obviously on display. It was according to God's will, God's purpose. He chose Abraham. God was going in choosing him to possess a people whose starting point was his choice. Two beginnings were kind of envisioned here, Abraham the man and Jacob the nation, or Israel the nation, with a life of Isaac sandwiched between. God's name and his character is going to be tied into them in a very special way. He is their God and identifies with them often in Scripture in various ways. There in Luke 13, they are in the kingdom of God to the chagrin of some. I hope it doesn't chagrin you that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are in God's kingdom. They, they are alive since God is their God, and he's not the God of the dead, affirms the Scriptures. See, so all hinges on them. God mediates to us through them himself. So can you say with a conviction, ah, he is to me the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Now, I'm just going to use the name Abraham. I understand he was named Abram to begin with until God changed it, but I'll just accommodatively use it. So Abraham did not at first envision Canaan. I mean, when God called him, he couldn't see Canaan. So he went out not knowing his destination, but as a response to the call of God. See, like when God calls, don't worry about the where, he'll take you there. Respond to the call. See, you don't have all the answers to begin with. Abraham was to learn that God's the source. He's the fount of everything. And Abraham had the harder question to answer that his natural strength, including Ishmael, could not serve God's purposes. Then, of course, Isaac was going to be a promised son. And he had to be given in a unique way because he's a picture, of course, of Jesus. 
So unless God, Abraham had to learn, unless God does a thing in him, it won't work. He can produce nothing of value unless it's God working in him. Does any of this make sense to us? <laughs> uh, by the way, I want you to relate it to yourself, but I'm showing you how that the Bible begins in the 12th chapter of Genesis early in, in, in terms of pages, early, to show us how God works. Now, Isaac, of course, is preeminently the promised son. And so he represents the work of God in Jesus. So he's born according to the Spirit. I don't, I don't know. Now, we're born according to the Spirit, but up until this time, then it skips all the way to Jesus is born according to the Spirit. Now, Abraham amassed wealth. Isaac just born into it. And received, not only born into it, received the inheritance. See, what? We have nothing that you're not given. So in that way, we're of the God of Isaac. We have nothing that's not given to us. Paul says, what do you have that you did not receive? Forgiveness of sins? Oh, yeah, we know. We Victory over sin? Oh, yeah, that was, that's given to us. Well, faith. Can I have my own faith? No, God, that's the work of God to give you faith. You're given everything. That's the God of Isaac I'm talking about. The law of the spirit of life that's possessed in Jesus, that's not attained, that's received. So the principle of Isaac's life is the principle of receiving. Like even, even his wife just received. He didn't check her out or anything. He Brought to him as father, uh, just received. As sons ourselves, you'll possess nothing that you did not receive. It won't be worth anything. Now, Jacob presents us with another side of God. He is the principle of God dealing with his children. So, you know, in theory, it's pretty easy to say, oh, yeah, I'll accept it. I'll be glad to accept it. But in fact, we go struggling to try to attain it because of the principle of Jacob working in us. We all got some Jacob in us. So the remnant of your natural strength, I know the old man's dead, but the remnant of your natural strength rears its ugly head. So Jacob is a picture of the dis discipling work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And it led all Jacob all the way from actually being a deceiver to being a prince with God. Now that's sanctification. God touched him and at last removed his natural strength. So kind of then a summary of my summary. Abraham saw God as father and proved him as the source of all good things and displays the purpose of God in his choice of us as sinners. Is, uh, Isaac received the inheritance as the son and shows us the life of God made available to us in the gift of his son. Jacob, attempting by cunning, to seize what was already going to be given to him sets forth the ways of God and the Holy Spirit handling of us, cutting short your natural strength to make way for your new nature in Jesus. Okay. That's where I want to go. So a little more detail. John 8th chapter, Jesus says, Before Abraham, I am. Well, why didn't he say before Noah I am? Why didn't he even say before Adam I am? Why did he start with Abraham? Because in a unique sense, recovery begins with Abraham. I, I'm going to establish that. Re recovery and recreation it's more than recovery. We're not just back to the Garden of Eden. We're in a recreation. 
And it starts with Abraham. And Jesus is in the business of recreation. Not just, not just patching up and making us look good. He's in the business. He's the second man. Now, that's the new creation. Now, so in Romans 4, Paul says that Abraham is the father of all that believe. See, the, fa- and the father's, uh, that's where you start with the father of all that believe. It wasn't Noah and it wasn't Adam. Between Adam and Abraham, yeah, God worked with people. I, I don't doubt that at all. But he begins in Abraham to not work with an individual, though Abraham is an individual, but with the view of humanity in mind. That is reaching now uh, for it all. This is, of course, completed in Jesus, naturally, and we know that. But Abraham is the father. Now, God calls Abraham, in God's call to Abraham, first in view there was a land, Second, in view, there's a great nation. Now, God had dealt universally with people, with the earth, like we all left Edom and Adam, see? The whole, the whole world, all cast out. He dealt with the whole world, of course, in Noah. All but eight souls destroyed, but he dealt with the whole world, but not for recovery and re creation. So, but now beginning in Abraham, that, that's where the good news really starts. Uh, so it began to work to undo the effects of the fall, and God's method was to secure land, then a people through whom then he could claim the world. And Abraham is the beginning of the choice of God and the first great reaction to the fall, I, I was—I didn't particularly like that when I wrote that down, but it's still, as he's the father of all those believing, this all recreation demands faith. I'm going to rest right there. It's the first great reaction to the fall. Now I know very good and well that God, in the fall, gathered up Adam and Eve and preached the seed and what have you. But I'm aware of that. But here Abraham's got this unique position to reveal God as redeemer who calls the world out of idolatry to faith in the living God. So as God committed that to Abraham, so even today he's committed the church to be the pillar and ground of the truth, a people for his name. Now, What's God got to work in recreation and, and, and recovery and recreation? Obviously, the sin problem's got to be dealt with, and it's been preached on justification. But also, one has to be sanctified. So God's got to have these two things in mind. And in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you see beautiful pictures of justification, especially in Abraham, and sanctification, especially in Jacob. Now, I know at times they may be a little hard to distinguish, but Scripture uh, can separate them for you. Well, Brother Roy Key, God bless his memory, uh, or his memory is a blessing to me. Put it this way, if God's not working in you, it doesn't matter that he worked for you. What he's saying, if you're not being sanctified, it doesn't matter that you were justified. So God is going to bring this all together in these three men. Now, Abraham, a little more detail. His task is different from Adam's. Abraham's task is different from Noah's. Like Noah's kind of into bringing the world back up again and repopulation, a little governmental Abraham's not interested in any of that, or God's not interested in Abraham being interested in that. Indeed, he's got to turn his back on the world. He's got to come out of the world. He had a nation, leave it. He had a home, leave it. He had a family, leave it. 
and looked for a city which had foundations as builder and maker's God. He himself had no city. He became a pilgrim. He wanted to establish anything on his own. He wanted to improve anything. He wanted to go, let's go down there in Canaan and improve it. That, that, no, that's not what. He was called out of this world, and he went out, not knowing where he's going to begin with, only that God called. In fact, that first call was come out. And that may be the first call you receive. God's whole purpose for man then stands Abraham, are you going to come out? Well, I don't want to sit here and make you think if Abraham said no, that it'd all be over. <laughs> See, God's trust is always in himself. <laughs> he, he knows what he's doing. And uh, Okay. Now, Abraham would go through uh, many a trial and tribulation and testing to really know God, or for God to be called the God of Abraham, in order that men and God can say, the God of Abraham, Abraham went through the testing. So God chose one who then believed, and from him were born the many. The many are blessed through Abraham, not because of a new doctrine, but because they received a new life. Abraham's privilege was to begin it. Of God's own will, Abraham was chosen. Learn the sovereignty of God. If the source of our life is in a sovereign God, so is everything that's worth having. Now, Stephen in Acts the seventh chapter informs us a little more detail here. He said, The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham. Now, I think that's the first time the word appeared appears in the Bible. God appeared. Now I'm not saying God didn't interact with some before, but I I think that's the first time the word of God appeared to and, but not just God, the God of glory appeared to Abraham. Well, now, which means Abraham saw something. See, glory means there's a revelation. Outside of a revelation, there's no glory. So, so he sees something, and that's enough. When you see something of God, come, you on your way. Yeah, your faith may not be complete, and you may not know much. He didn't. Didn't even know where he's going. But it was enough. He saw the glory of God. It's because the glory of God appeared to our father Abraham. So we see God and we glory. As a matter of fact, your reaction probably to seeing the glory of God is as close to worship as you'll ever get. Amen. Now, idolatry, I've got to admit, an idolater all his life doesn't see everything perfectly and at once. And I don't expect that, but his faith is enough at this point that he's on the move. Yeah. Yeah. Now, he didn't, reach, uh, he didn't reach Canaan first. He got to Har Haran Sojourned there until Terah, his father, died. And in Terah's death, <laughs> there's a resurrection. God shows up again. God does that in some deaths. He really showed up at the death of Jesus, you know. But his whole plan shifted into higher gear here in Terah's death because Terah was not part of the plan anyway. So he appears to Abraham again, showing him all of the purposes. And now Abraham's on his way. And at last he's in Canaan. <laughs> I, t I get tickled at this. The Bible says when he reached Sheshem, and the Canaanites were there. He's letting, me know. he's letting me know he made it to Canaan anyway. 
So God's man is now where God wants him. At this point, it's not a question of does Abraham buy 40 acres and a plow. That's, that's not under consideration. But it is a question of God's power in God's man where God wants him and where God's power is, there you can inherit. And if you don't get close to God's power, you'll never take possession of anything. Now, you, you can't separate your inheritance from God's power unless God rule is established and the enemies routed, we will have no inheritance. So Abraham reached Sheshem and, and, and wonderful things happened there, but I want to I moved right on as Abraham did from Sheshem and went to Bethel. Now he pitched his tent between Bethel and Ai. Bethel was west. So when he faced Bethel, which is by interpretation the house of God. Ai by interpretation, as I understand it, is a heap of ruins. So when you face Bethel, you got your back to the heap of ruins. The heap of ruins to me is just the fallen man in Adam. And he built an altar, Abraham. See, between God's house and Adam's ruins, Got to be an altar. Got to be an altar. For in principle, only Jesus is accepted on it. But if you're in Jesus, <laughs> he'll accept your sacrifice too. Great test of Abraham happened right then. The famine struck. And he was Shanghai to Egypt to eat. Found himself in an embarrassing situation, or maybe an awkward one to say the least. And he learned there's no place like Canaan. It's not here in Egypt. And he got out. And he went back to Bethel. Go back to the house of God when you're in trouble. See, justification... It's quite a gift, granted that the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. But sanctification is another matter. It doesn't come as quickly. Abraham had been promised it, but he wasn't established in uh, Canaan. So he had to go through the establishment. It's just a picture of sanctification to me. It may not be to you, whatever. In Abraham's many tests and experiences, his character began to grow. <laughs> or as uh, Paul would say, experience builds character, works hope. It goes together there. Experience works hope. And Abraham experiences was building his character. Now, let me give you just a one little for instance. You remember his battle with the kings. Um, on his return, he met Melchizedek and someone else. He met the king of Sodom, of all people. Well, he had re that's, that's who he'd retrieved the property of and the people for the king of Sodom and brought it all back. Now, you know the story of Melchizedek, but let me tell you about the king of Sodom. He was kind to Abraham, says, uh, here, you take the spoils. You brought our people back. You, you Abraham says, no, I, I will not take one latch from you. Here. My reward is from my father. He had learned who his reward was from. Very instructive. His benefactor is the living God. So he took his stand apart from God. There is no reward. 
So when God said to Abraham, do not be afraid. I am your shield. I am your reward. That's enough. But it's needed. That much is needed. Soon Abraham focuses on his son, on the heir, let me put it that way, focuses on the heir. Did not God know that Abraham wanted a son? Yes, yes, yes. God wants us, though, to enter into his thoughts and ask for that which he wants to give. I knew I'd get an amen from that, and I said it for your benefit. God answers. One will come from your own body will be your heir. Then, of course, the most profound statement up until that time, or certainly at close to the time, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now, once more, God affirmed that his purpose with Abraham was in relation to the land, and so he tells him, I am the Lord God brought you out of Chaldees to give you this land to inherit. So God's answer is where God's power operates. Recovery of that land depended upon shed blood. So Abraham gathers the sacrifices, maintains the vigil, the power of God and the way of God is always the pathway of the cross. Death, and at last, you know, God laid down his life. For us. Now, all he asks you to do is lay down yours for him. Amen. The cross has done its work for you. Now it must do its work in you. Amen. Just an explanation of justification, sanctification. Abraham experienced great horror here, great darkness at this event. See, when you see the purposes of God to which you are called, then look at yourself. It undoes us all. And know that self must be crucified. A crucified self, be it Jesus or you, is a great blessing to God and leads to great possessions for all involved. That's in Genesis 15, chapter 14, verse. Now Abraham really focuses on this son. Galatians, of course, talks a lot about it, and Brother Jason did a wonderful job, so I'm just going to skip that. Abraham did, had to go through a lot of trials and testings in bringing in Isaac. Unless Isaac is God's gift, according to his promise, God can't use him. A son of the natural strength, as a matter of fact, anything of your natural strength produces Ishmael. How's that for the work of God? I don't think so. But when Abraham's body was as good as dead, Isaac comes. When you reckon yourselves dead, then you can believe in God who gives life to the dead. Say, God waits, waits until you're at the end of yourself. Then bang, Isaac comes. Jesus comes. With Isaac, it's a matter of time. There's always time for Ishmael. Yeah, you can get him any day. But only God's time for Isaac. The fruit of your own strength will produce hard lessons. But what God does through you, impossible of yourself, is always very good. You know, that's the way the Bible starts out with the very good. Hey, created. That's very good. Very good. As Abraham rep, uh, represents faith, so Sarah represents grace. The free woman. Separate faith 
from grace or separate Abraham from Sarah having an offspring. Separate faith from grace, you get Ishmael. You separate it on your own peril. Do not separate faith from grace. Faith that does not rest in God's grace is of no value. Amen. Now, Abraham had to un undertake a traumatic experience right here. He had to pray to God that God would open the wombs of the household of Abimelech. I won't go into all the story. I'm just telling you Abraham had to do that if you remember. Now, how can this man with tears in his eyes, anguish in his heart over that heir of his, that son that was supposed to come from a dead womb of his wife, pray for the wombs of the others. But he did. And bam, Isaac is conceived. I was telling Brother Ricky, uh, they had me preach to this guy that didn't have an honest heart. And I poured out my heart for 45 minutes to him. And he's played me for a fool. I sent somebody was behind me. And I turned around and four big old strapping young men there said, we want to accept Jesus. We'd like to be baptized. They were baptized within five minutes. I didn't even know they was there. <laughs> See, God's got a way of humbling you. He humbled Abraham. Let's talk about Isaac a minute here. No history typifies Christ as does Isaac. Constituted heir by divine promise. Born after the spirit, the child of promise as even you are now. That's the reason. The God of Isaac is your God too. To Sarah, especially Abraham's, uh, the Isaac is the beloved son, laid on the altar without objection, received back from the dead as the risen one. Isaac's bride brought to him from a far country, yet of one blood of one family. Isaac occupied his inheritance, never leaving it. Isaac did nothing but what he saw the father do. <laughs> Simply, you just read the life of Isaac, it's just like he rarely had an original thought. He's just doing what the father did. Ishmael mocked Isaac. Isaac said nothing. Isaac is the man, as Jesus was, John 5, 19, doing nothing of himself. Even his tomb was provided by his father. So Abraham, as he embodies God's plan and standard, Isaac represents God's life and God's power and God's storehouse. God's promises to Isaac were the same as he gave to Abraham. I will perform the oath I swore to Abraham your father, bestowed on Isaac, he become the son of promise. The God of Isaac is a God of giving. The God of Isaac comes to us and gives us everything in his son. The secret for us is receiving, not achieving. Amen. The way to God is not an exercise of the will, but by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Freedom, victory, salvation, life are all bestowed, not attained. Look, when you're born into wealth, it's difficult to be poor. Isaac was rich. He was born into it. You're rich. You're born into it. This is Isaac's God. We receive. We relax. We rest. Faith. And we enjoy. The enjoy... <laughs> is a product of this. It always comes. Which, what you enjoy, you praise to God, which brings him glory. Isaac did ask one question. 
You know, where's the sacrifice? And the answer, of course, is the same when you ask it. God provides. So it's ours to receive in order that we might measure up to the divine standard. That's the reason you must receive it. That you can have the strength to measure up to the divine standard. Christianity Christianity compels us to receive. Just go to Galatians 3 and 4. Like we're heirs, we partake of the promises, we enter into the inheritance. Now there's two sides of the work of Christ with more to come because he's still working. We are in Christ for justification. Christ is in us for sanctification. Now Jesus puts it tersely, and Brother Tony quoted it today, abide in me and I in you. See, by virtue of us abiding in him, we get to partake of his history. By virtue of him abiding in us, we partake of his life and appropriate his power. It's the care for today and answers and assures our future. That you are in Christ, back to that, is the work of God. That's 1 Corinthians 1.30. You're in Christ. That you're in Christ is God's work. And is made unto you wisdom, justification, sanctification, redemption. I think I'd die if someone took that out of the Bible. Life wouldn't be worth living. That, that verse, just right now, gives me more assurance. I can just see myself standing before the judgment bar of God, and I think of some old judge saying, well, answer this question for me. <laughs> and I turn to my Savior there at the right hand and say, he is my wisdom. Son, you're before the high court here. I want you to justify yourself. My Savior is my justification. Keep right on going. It helps me. Now, old man was crucified with him. That's something you know. According to... Paul in Romans. Our death in Christ and freedom from sin is not a doctrine. Again, it's an inheritance. Not what you do, but what you receive. And that has been preached here this week. But it's not the end of the matter. Christ is in us for the past, but for today and the future. We have his power, and you can say no to sin. Amen. Yes to righteousness. Amen. And Paul says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ in me. That's kind of like equal to saying, you know, only Jesus really satisfies the heart of God. Amen. And that's fine. I'm in Jesus. I'm not jealous of it at all. In fact, I say glory. Amen. Like Isaac. Everything is done for us by the Father, and that gives me great comfort. Yet, there is the God of Jacob, and I have just a few moments, which illustrates the work of this, of you being discipled by the Holy Spirit and can produce trembling as you work out your salvation. Jacob reminds you of the fallacy of the natural strength. In Isaac, we boldly proclaim sins conquered. In Jacob, we confess, I could fall. So the God of Isaac declares the sufficiency of Jesus. The God of Jacob is telling you the deficiency of yourself. And those contrasts run parallel through the Bible, time after time after time. 
God always leads us in triumph. I'm the chiefest of sinners. Sin shall not have dominion over me. Take heed lest you fall. How do you reconcile it all? I don't have to. I have to believe it. To have only the God of Isaac, you'll become haughty and boastful. To have only the God of Jacob will make you despondent. You need them both. Jacob points to the Holy Spirit's work in you. Now, he's not dealing with the old man. That's been crucified at the cross. I want you to understand that. But he's dealing with the remnants of our natural strength, which must be overcome, and it was overcome in Jacob. Uh, yes. In the epic of Jacob, and it is an epic, we find the God of Jacob, and we marvel at what we see. Listen quickly. We see God's relentless in his pursuit of his chosen, and Jacob was chosen. We see that one's beginning is not paramount, but where one finishes is paramount. We, God never chastised Jacob verbally, never the first time said one thing in chastisement, but kept giving him those exceeding great and precious promises that Jacob might partake of the divine nature. If you think it'll work for you, and it will, it'll work for Jacob too, and it did. Yes, it required circumstances, and it required circumstances for you, and it does for all of us, which leads to the receiving of the end of our faith, even the salvation of our souls. Jacob's story is an amazing one, and yet you've all lived it. It's easy to judge him selfish and irresponsible. irresponsible. God didn't. When you finally see yourself as God sees you, you'll find Jacob in you. But when you see the end of Jacob, you praise the God of grace, hopeless man, has become a vessel for God's purpose. You know, in the traumatic experience of Jacob, fleeing from home, scared for his life, he wound up at Bethel first. He's so confused that I don't think God could speak to him from a burning bush or appear to him like Abraham. But he did let him have a big dream. And he blessed him. But then he went through his trials and tribulations. 20 years hard labor. But he finally made it back to Bethel. And he was a changed man. On that way back, he kept having, finally wrestled with God, you know. Just, I'm having, a, my time's up, I'm going to be brief. You know what God did with him that night? Changed his name, there's one thing. Mm -hmm from being a dissembler to a prince with God. He touched him at his strength. Jacob must have been a powerful man. I'm talking human. Must have been. Touched him at his strength. God's got to touch you at yours. I don't know what yours is. It may be ambition. It may be self-love. I, I don't know what it is. But it's got to be touched. And he touched Jacob, and he changed him. Finally, this man, day by day, more sanctified and more sanctified, going through troubles, but he keeps getting more 
dear. Then he begins to lose it all. Cattle herders, no grass, starvation, sons turning on him, selling Joseph, his beloved son. That all he's got left that's really dear to him is Benjamin. And that day, Benjamin had to go. Jacob has finally lost everything dear to him. You've got to go there. If it's dear to the flesh, it's got to go. Well, we know the story of the sons come out okay. But the famine was still there. And I marvel in this. Jacob says, I'll, 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 go, to, I'll go to Jacob. I'll go to Joseph. So he starts and abruptly stops at Beersheba, kind of the barter town and builds an altar and lays his all on the line. God, I'm not going unless you say go. I've finally learned I don't make the decisions around this place. You do. Do you want me to go? I w I'll stay here even if I do not see my beloved God says go you know that story now what's the first thing he does when he gets there has a meeting with Pharaoh Pharaoh who's Pharaoh just the greatest monarch on earth and the Bible says two times that Jacob Blessed Pharaoh. Now, who's the greatest? Amen. All the way from a dissimilar to a prince with God and is the greatest on earth and was able at last, still a pilgrim, still crippled, to lean on his staff and give the blessings to the sons and to Joseph's sons. And the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob wants you because he's got to work for you. And you can go all the way to being a prince with God. 